New Direction, my name is Jay Izzo, and I say it every week, and I'm about to say it again. Again, ready? It's going to be a great show. I am telling you, this is going to be a great show. Uh, the book is entitled Catalytic Leadership, uh, 12 Keys to Becoming an Intentional Leader who makes a difference. Let me, by the way, Dr. William uh, C. Attaway is uh, is going to be joining us here. Let me just ask you something. Everybody, you know, wants to talk about leadership and everybody wants to be a great leader. You know, you don't want to be an average leader, right? No one wants to be an average leader. And nobody wants to be just a leader and nobody wants to be just a leader with a title. You know, you want to be a catalytic leader. I don't even like that. Don't you like the sound of that? I want to be a catalytic leader. Come on. Who doesn't, who doesn't want to make a difference? Who doesn't want to stir the pot? Who doesn't want to get things going? Who doesn't want to make things happen? Who doesn't want to do that? That's what a catalytic leader does, right? That's what a catalytic leader does for his people. Catalyt and by the way, to become a catalyt catalytic leader, I'm, I'm just going to tell you something. These 12 principles that Dr. Attaway has uh, put together, I, I'm just going to tell you, you can apply them to your family. You can apply them to your business. Uh, whether you're profit, nonprofit, whether you're small business, corporation, every one of these 12 keys to becoming an attention leader who makes a difference is going to apply to you. Folks, this book is for you, right? Great quotes. I mean, timeless quotes, quotes that'll make a difference, quotes that you will want to keep in your brain and in your heart and in your mind and your soul and your spirit. I'm just telling you, it's that kind of a book. So uh, make sure um, you're going to want to check it out. You're going to listen to the show. Before we get to William, <laughs> I do what we do every week, right? And we walk you through the four areas of your life, right? Here's the deal. We are four-part people. We are physical, mental, emotional, spiritual people. And as we've learned from interviews in the past, from dealing with special operations forces guys, and even a major general that we had on the show, right? They said the same thing. You know what? If you're not working on those four areas every day, you're not growing. And when you're not growing, you're dying. So we ask you what you're doing for your training every day in the physical, the mental, the emotional, and spiritual. And we rate your, you rate yourself on a scale of one to 10. So for instance, the physical area, scale of one to 10, one, my training is ugh, and 10, my training is woohoo, right? And five being average, right? How would you rate yourself in terms of getting enough exercise, drinking enough water, getting enough sleep, eating right, right? Five being average. What would you give yourself? Okay. See now, okay. Listen, whatever that number is, don't panic. All right, because it's okay. Right? That's just a starting number where we're going to make things better from here. All right? So if you're a three, don't go, oh man, I really bad. Okay. Well, then what can you do to change it? What can you do to get to a 3.5 right now? Mm -hmm. Right? There's a number of things you could do. You're probably not, probably eating some things you shouldn't be eating. Maybe take a little longer walk. It could be a number of things, right? Go to bed a little earlier. Number of things. Okay. All right. So you got your first number. Second number is, that intellectual mental number, right? And the truth is, my, my wife has said it over and over again. You know what? If you're going to be a couch potato, don't think that you're going to grow, you know, with knowledge by having things come at you because that's not a way it works. You've got to be an active learner. Oh, by the way, uh, Dr. Attaway talks about being a learner as being a part of being a great catalytic leader. It's true. You can't, you can't be a catalytic leader, you can't make a difference if you're not constantly learning. Because if you know it all, then I guess that limits how much you can lead. Huh. Got to be a constant learner. So what are you learning to grow in your in your job, in your life, in your, in your relationships? What are you doing, right? Are, are, how is that going for you? What, are you doing the right things? Are you learning the right things? Are you active being an active participant? What's, what would you give you for a number, scale one to ten? Okay, that's your second number. Third number, right? That's your emotional number. And we make it real simple on the show, right? Emotionally, here's how we evaluate it. One, how well are you able to control your emotions? And yes, you can control them when you're under when you're under stress, pressure, right? Hangry, in a Christmas line, waiting, trying to find the right gift, Thanksgiving, families all over. How well are you able to control your emotions under those circumstances? I'll wait. Secondly, how well are you able to tap into and understand the emotions of others? Hmm. Interestingly, Dr. William talks about listening in the book. You can't be a great leader if you're not going to listen. Can you? You got to be able to tap into the emotions and understand the emotions of other people. 
So let's give one to 10. How would you say you're doing there? That's your third number. Fourth number is the spiritual number. <laughs> and I know that all over the world, there's a lot of people go, yeah, I'm not, Jay, I'm, I'm not spiritual. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a spiritual person. You know what the truth is? We all live by faith. We all do. We live by faith. We, the fact of the matter is when you got your bowl of cereal out and you poured the milk on it, you took that first spoonful, you believed it wasn't poisonous and you put it in your mouth. That took faith. When you took that sip of coffee, you thought it wasn't poisonous and you drank it. It's, you did it by faith. When you put your key in the car this morning and you turned it forward and you believed that it was going to turn on, guess what? You did that by faith. When you stepped off the curb and you saw the sign that said, walk, right? You walked across the street. Why? Believing that no car was going to hit you because you live by faith. The truth of the matter is we all live by faith. And you know what the truth of the matter is? We all run to something when things go south. When, when, when things go bad, what do you run to? Because I'm going to tell you something right now. Whatever you run to, that's your God. That's true. Sometimes people run to themselves and they rely on themselves. Well, then you're, you've made yourself your own God. Whether it is God, whether it is nature, whether it is meditation, whatever it is that you run to, here's my question. Is it working for you? And if it's not working, what do you got to do to change it? So how well are you doing in your spiritual area on a scale of 1 to 10? Right? Those four areas, by the way, are like the air in the tires of your car. <laughs> if the air is not to the right level, right, that's not full, what happens? Car leans to the left. It doesn't mm -hmm. leans to the right. It doesn't work efficiently. Things can happen. It can break, right? So what you want to do is make sure that your tires are all to the right level, the right height, full. Speaking of which, that's Dr. William Attaway. He's a leadership coach for Catalytic Leadership and a, com a company which he founded to help leaders to intentionally grow and thrive. He served in local church ministry for nearly 25 years. And as a pastor, author, speaker, he's the lead pastor of Southview Community Church uh, in Herndon, Virginia, which is near Washington, D.C., if you're trying to get a place on that. Uh, he served there for over 17 years. He holds a Ph.D. in Old Testament with emphasis in biblical backgrounds and archaeology. And he's an avid student researcher who speaks about leadership and archaeology. He has taught undergraduate courses in Itawamba uh, Community College. Try saying that three times fast. Originally from Birmingham, Alabama. You'll catch a little bit of that accent. Dr. William now lives in Northern Virginia with his wife, Charlotte, and their two daughters. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show. Welcome to the first time, and maybe not the last time, I'm pretty sure, Dr. William C. Attaway. William, welcome to A New Direction. Jay, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Well, I'm glad that you are, you're here. I'm honored that you are with us today. And uh, Catalytic Leadership is a book that um, it just really rang with me. In fact, let's just dig right into the introduction here. Um, <laughs> evidently, chemistry was not your strongest subject. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't mine either, by the way. Uh, but we did talk about catalysts, yeah. right? And that is the crux of this book. So help us make the connection between your um, awesome chemistry <laughs> career and uh, a, a catalyst and why that's so important to catalytic leadership. You know, Jay, when I went to college, I went as a, as a pre-pharmacy major. I intended to go into that field. I had worked in a pharmacy in high school, and I thought this was a great way to serve people and help people. And I get there, I go through chemistry and inorganic chemistry, and I get to organic and that was the point at which I really realized, you know, this is not really what I want to spend the rest of my life doing. <laughs> I think I think I'm done. I think I'm done with this. Um, but in those brief chemistry studies, I discovered the power of a catalyst. Uh, a catalyst is something that you introduce to incite or to accelerate significant change or action. Now, I'd been a student of leadership for a number of years at that point. I went to my first leadership conference, was invited to attend when I was 15 years old. And at that point, I began to, to connect some dots. I was thinking, you know, every great leader I had ever studied or learned about or learned from at that point in my journey, they would identify with that definition of a catalyst to incite or to accelerate significant change, to make an impact, to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Any catalytic leader would, would resonate with that. And so I began to connect this idea of, of a catalyst with leadership. And over the last 
well, nearly 30 years now. Uh, I've been trying to see exactly what it takes for a leader to become catalytic. I, you have these uh, in this, it's hard to get out of the introduction in this book because it's so packed, um, believe it or not. But uh, you, you quote Brian Herbert and you say, the capacity to learn is a gift, the ability to learn is a skill, the willingness to learn is a choice. And then you yeah. go on to say that catalytic leadership begins with a decision. And actually it's five decisions. Mm. that you have here um I'm, i you, you may not be, I, I know how this goes i've written books before so i'll just i'll just r- rattle them off unless you've got them um a decision not to sit on the sidelines any longer but to step into the game and take the ball mm-hmm. help us there you know i, I think it, it's a choice it's a decision and it's a decision that you get to make and i get to make every single day am i going to be the most teachable person in the room mm. or Am I going to think I've got all the answers? Mm. Am I going to be more concerned with answering the questions or asking the right questions? Mm. We get to decide. Uh, My goal, the decision I make every single morning is I want to be the most teachable person in every room I'm in, every conversation I'm in. I want to ask at least twice more, twice as many questions as I provide answers. Mm. All right. It, by the way, you're not going to be able to do that much today. You're going to be doing. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. sorry about that. I, I know you'd like to be the most teachable person in the room, but uh, I need you to go on the opposite side today. Uh, <laughs> I'll do my best. No, thank you. Okay. Decision two: a decision to do the reps in practice when no one is watching. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is any leader knows that you're not born knowing how to lead well. You know, you don't you don't wake up one day and think, oh, wow, I'm a fully mature, developed leader. How'd that happen? I didn't mean for that to happen, but here I am. It takes reps. It takes practice. It takes discipline. You learn how to do this. It's a skill. And like any skill, it has to be developed. What's your plan to do that? This one's interesting. A decision to eat smart. Hmm. Yeah, well, this goes back to to what you were saying earlier, right? The fuel that you put in your body and the exercise that you keep your body in good condition with, this matters. And we think it only matters to our physical health, but that's because we're trying to compartmentalize our lives. And the fact of the matter is you and I are integrated beings. Every part touches every other part. If physically you are not in a good place, guess what? That's going to affect your leadership. Well, you know, we we talk a lot about other things, but it's really, really true. You know, exercise, Mm -hmm. diet, sleep, uh, hydration. Yes. They really are important pieces because (laughs) I go back to the uh, airline when you're on the Mm. the flight attendant, the flight attendant, right? Yeah, right. And she says, you know, if the cabin should lose air pressure, Mm -hmm. you put on your mask first. Exactly. And then, then help others. Well, if you don't take care of the, by the way, the shell, right? right? The exactly. only thing that you have, you know, you, you're, you can't help anybody. <laughs> That's exactly it. I mean, if you have to make sure that you are in the best yeah. place you can be so right. that you can help others. Yeah. I can't help anybody else if I'm not in a good spot. Right. Right. Which, which leads to number four decision to make sleep discipline a priority. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I I talked to way too many leaders for whom this is not even in their top 10 priorities in their life. Guess what? When I don't get enough sleep, I don't make great decisions. I don't think that's just me. (laughs) No, I don't think it's just you. Well, but, but you, you know, here's the other part of that, that is so true is that when we're tired, yeah, we're, we've stretched our emotional bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And so it makes it even, you know, difficult, more difficult for us to control our emotions when we're exhausted. Uh, absolutely. Uh, a writer and speaker named John Acuff says it this way. He says, I don't get smarter the later I stay up. Mm. Mm. I think that's brilliant. Mm. And, and he talks about this in the context of conversations and, and, and discussions with his wife. Right. And they go in, sometimes late into the night. And he's like, you know, I realized one day I don't get smarter 
the later I stay up. <laughs> Sometimes the absolute best thing you can do is say, you know what? We're going to put a pin in that. We're going to get a good night's sleep and we're going to tackle it fresh in the morning. Yeah. After we are rested, you keep trying to press, you keep trying to push beyond the point at which you're exhausted. Guess what? Bad things happen. <laughs> right. Because physically and emotionally, you're not in a good spot. How can you lead when you're not in a good spot? Well, again, I'm, I'm just, you, you just, chi- there's things that I'm just thinking of and I'm like going, well, when you're tired, you can't be creative. Oh, absolutely. Are well, <laughs> not, not, not good creative. <laughs> <laughs> not productively. <laughs> I mean, which, which means, I mean, if it's true that every problem has a creative solution, mm-hmm. then ultimately that means then if we're t- exhausted, we can't be solving problems. That's right. That's exactly right. We are going to be limiting ourselves by the right. choices that we make. Mm. Mm. I hope you're hearing that out there, everybody. Okay. All right. Fifth, fifth decision, a decision to choose what you want most rather than what you want right now. Mm. This one. Yeah. And I'll credit that one to Andy Stanley, who I first heard say that, you know, I think, I think it's, it's so important that we understand that distinction. And this is again, true in all the areas that you listed earlier, you know, do I want good health or do I want a Twinkie? <laughs> What do I want most versus what I want now, right? right do right. do I want to be able to climb a flight of stairs without wheezing, or do I want another bacon cheeseburger? <laughs> you now, choose. Now, Doc, you cannot go bacon on me. <laughs> you can't can't do that. I, that. I use it on myself first. Bacon <laughs> cheeseburgers are one of God's greatest gifts to us. I just, I, Amen, brother. I appreciate that. That's, that's absolutely true. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about the next piece of this because you say we are a product of our choices, but we also need to remember uh, today is a fresh beginning. Yes. And so put that together because you have these uh, beliefs. Uh, you have these, uh, what I guess there's seven beliefs um, that you have that, um, but to help us help us walk through those first two pieces that we're a product of our choices, yet today is a fresh beginning. It's true. Our choices define us. Right, but we are not limited by our past choices. Mm. Every day is a new day. There is a fresh beginning, and and too many leaders that I talk to think that they are bound by mistakes that they've made in the past. Yeah, mistakes have consequences, right? When we screw up something, <laughs> that, that has consequences to it, right. no doubt. And, and and we have to own that, right? We can't we can't say, well, somebody else's fault. We can't play the victim, and we can't point fingers. That neither of those is good leadership. But we have to understand today is a new day. Today is a fresh start. Mm. We cannot be bound by what has happened because we get a new day. Every day is a new day. Every day is a fresh start. And one of the challenges that I will often use with leaders is to remind them, you are not the sum of your mistakes. Mm. You are not the sum of your failures. Every experience, everything that has happened in your life thus far has happened for purpose right? You can choose to learn from it, right? Don't let it define you. Learn from it. But there's no such thing as a wasted experience, right? Every experience is part of your journey. What are you going to do with it? You got to learn from it or are you going to let it limit you? You get to decide. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I think here is, this is where it gets difficult, right? Is because we want to just look at the good experiences that we believe Mm -hmm. that Oh, lead yeah. us to where we are. It's it's not. It's the bad experiences too. Absolutely. It's it's Absolutely. our our failures are so important mm-hmm. to who we are and where we are today. Yeah. Right. Show me a business leader who has never failed, and I'll show you one who's never succeeded. Mm. Every successful leader that I talk to, everyone I've ever coached, everyone I've ever interviewed. They want to tell me about their failures. I interviewed a guy yesterday morning for my podcast and we were talking about this and he just kept coming across and this is, I failed here and then I failed here and then I failed here and then I failed here. Not because he was pointing to himself as a victim of all of those failures, but because those were learning opportunities that helped to make him who he is now. Those fed into the success that he has found now, right? which would not exist without all of the failures that preceded it. Yeah, 
I, I also take a page here that says, you know, when you get tested or when you are going through trials, mm -hmm. this is where um, you develop your perseverance. That's right. I've uh, read that somewhere. I have too. And I've read that, you know, if you let perseverance do what it's supposed to do, it actually kind of matures you and makes you complete so that you can handle more things down the road. So yeah. I've, I've, I've kind of subscribed to the idea that sometimes when we, when we're in the midst of trial or failure, or we've blown it, or we've messed up, this is, this is where your resiliency gets developed. Mm -hmm. And that resiliency is really what builds so much character eventually over the course of time. And so I, right. And I really believe that. And as a leader, I think you have to have, you know, show me a leader that's never failed and I won't show you a leader. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Right. <laughs> the only way not to fail is to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. His name is Dr. William C. Attaway. The book is called Catalytic Leadership, 12 Keys to Becoming an Intentional Leader Who Makes a Difference. You're listening to him here on A New Direction. Hey, folks, look, I have two outstanding uh, sponsors. And and by the way, if you want to be a sponsor of the show, uh, I'd love to have you just contact me uh, at the show and would love to have you be a sponsor. But I got to tell you, the elite team at Epic Physical Therapy will provide you a customized treatment plan tailored to your individual needs, whether they work with young athletes, professional athletes, people like you and me. Look, when you're ready for your epic relief, epic recovery, epic results, don't look any further. Go to epicpt.com. That's E P I C P T.com. And Linda Craft Team Realtors telling you more than 37 years, they don't help people buy and sell homes. What they do is they help them make a life transition. Yes, they do real estate, but think of it this way every time you have lived in a home and sold, moved, it's been a life transition. That's what she helps people do successfully. She's been doing it now for over 37 years for thousands of people, and she could, you could be one of them too. I'm telling you, her team is amazing. They're outstanding. They're called the legends of customer service. Check them out at lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And we're back here on A New Direction uh, with William, uh, uh, Dr. William C. Attaway. And his book, uh, Catalytic Leadership, 12 Keys to Becoming an Intentional Leader Who Makes a Difference. Uh, we are going to start going into these uh, 12 uh, principles. So you ready to go? Let's go. Let's go. All right. Uh, first one is cultivate a teachable spirit. Mm -hmm. um, this one, uh, I, I don't know. Is this one the hardest? Is this, or I, would you say this is the most difficult one? Is this one that's the most challenging? Well, where does that fall on that line? I would define it as being the non-negotiable element. Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you get the other 11 right. If you don't get this one right, uh, you fail. That's awesome. I love that. That's awesome. So let's talk about what does it mean when you say you got to have a teachable spirit? It's a decision, Jay. It's a decision to choose to learn. I'm going to learn. And here's the key. I can learn from anybody in any situation. I'm going to walk into every conversation, every relationship, every meeting, every job, every circumstance in my life, understanding I can learn something here. Now, sometimes I'm going to learn what not to do, <laughs> but that can be incredibly valuable. You know, uh, there are some people who, who just will not, who say, you know what, uh, you've got to be better than me for me to learn anything from you. <laughs> and <laughs> you're giggling because I'm laughing too, because I actually know these non-coachable people. Yeah. Right. That they, that, that if you're not, if you haven't done as much business as I have, there's no reason for me to talk to you because you can't teach me anything. Yeah. I, 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 that, that is a way to live. Uh, and that's going to be an example <laughs> of somebody that I'm going to learn from what not to do. Uh, because why would you limit yourself like that? Why would you mm -hmm. limit yourself and your opportunity to learn from other people and other situations and the experiences of other people? Mm -hmm. I don't care where they are on the success spectrum. Mm -hmm. I can learn something from them and I will because I'll ask questions and I'll come with a teachable spirit. But that's a choice. It's a decision that you and I have to make every single right. day. When we make it, we can learn. Like I said earlier, there's no such thing as a wasted experience. If I have a teachable spirit, you talk about, uh, if you're going to have a teachable spirit, you also have to have perpetual optimism. Yes. 
<laughs> talk about why optimism is also coupled with the teachable spirit. No one will ever be more optimistic than the leader. <laughs> if the leader is not optimistic, uh, do you really expect the team to bring that to the table? If the leader walks in and they start and they say, hey, you know, well, things are bad and they're going to get worse and I can see nothing but bleak, cold, dark days ahead. Do you expect anybody else around the table to say, well, hey, you know what? I, I see them. I see. I see fantastic days. No, everybody's keying in to how the leader is leading. Mm. A leader has to have perpetual optimism. Mm. That's part of leadership. Now, that does not mean that does not mean that you ignore reality. I think Max Dupree is dead on. Uh, one of a leader's first jobs is to define reality as it is, not as they wish it were. Mm. Okay. So we have to define reality. You're not like sticking your head in the sand and pretending you don't see data. I'm a right. big fan of data-based decision-making. Right. That's a key to leadership. But it does mean that no matter where the numbers are, where the data is, do I believe there's a way to go forward? Do I believe the best days are yet ahead? And as long as I can believe that, I can lead. The minute I stop believing that, it's time for me to step back. Mm. That's awesome. When you, you quote Marcus Buckingham here, and I think this is a powerful quote. The opposite of a leader is not a follower. It's a pessimist. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. A well, because what's a leader's greatest tool is to inspire other people. Mm. It's to inspire other people. Does pessimism inspire anybody? <laughs> Have you ever been inspired by a pessimist who just wants to tell you what's wrong? No. Does that, no. Does that fire you up? Does that make you, oh, I can't wait. Let's go. Yeah. No, it doesn't fire you. No, nobody's inspired by a pessimist. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's... That's, that's, that's awesome. I, I, one of my favorite, uh, I learned from him still, uh, even though he's not with us anymore, Larry King, mm -hmm. you have a quote here in your book. Oh, says, yeah. I remind myself every morning that nothing I say this day will teach me anything. Yeah. So if I'm going to learn, I must do it by listening. I never learned anything by talking. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes back to that attitude, that mm -hmm. posture. Am I going to have a learning posture? In whatever situation I'm in, mm. a teachable spirit. Mm. It, it, it is reflected in the questions that you ask. It's reflected in the fact that you're asking more questions than you're making statements. Too many leaders like to hear themselves talk and all they're concerned about is what they're going to say next. And the only time they stop and take a breath is when they're preparing the next thing they're going to say. <laughs> That's not a teachable spirit. Yeah. <laughs> That's not no. It's no, not what Larry King was talking about. No, it, it's not. It's it's not. And, you know, it seems so, I don't know if the word is ironic, that, you know, we have to talk for a living. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> on the show, because it's the only way we could get a point across. It just yeah. seems so ironic that we're doing this. Um, I, one of the things you bring in there is the environment. You talk about the environment that you're in. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and and it, it, you say something about is affirmation part of your environment? And that you also start by saying oftentimes environments are dismissed as irrelevant. Help us understand the importance of environment and the environments that we're in and how that plays a role into um, having a teachable spirit. Sure. Uh, the environment that you create and the environment that you operate inside of, you have a great deal of control over as a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about this in, in, in a certain context. So, so I, you mentioned earlier, I pastor a church outside of D.C. on the western suburbs, mm -hmm. and I've been here for just over 18 years now. Uh, I've been talking for over 18 years about how environments matter. When somebody walks on for the first time onto our campus, they're walking into an environment. Okay, People are going to understand and feel that environment. Mm -hmm. Do they feel welcomed? Do they feel expected? Do they feel safe? Is the environment clean? If they've got kids and they go into the kids area, is that environment safe and clean and fun? Or are they worried about their kid the whole time they're separated from them? When they walk into the, the worship environment, are they walking into a place where they feel like, hey, you know what? They, they were expecting me. I, I, I went to visit a church one time and walked into their to their entry area 
and there were a couple people in their, um, I guess, part of their greeting team who were standing over handing out uh, bulletins that morning. And they were talking to themselves, talking to each other. And, and they looked over at me as though, oh, what are you doing here? And that was the, like, that's how I felt. And I walked in and, and took the bulletin and went and sat down. I made it from my car to the seat and back to my car. And not one person said a word. Mm. Did I feel expected? Mm. Did I feel welcomed? Mm. Did I feel valued? Mm. That is the power of an environment. Mm. Now, that's an environment that as a leader, you have the ability to, to create to a certain extent. Right? But let's talk about, as a leader, your personal environment. You decide the environment that you're going to operate in. Am I going to have an environment where I'm going to be learning? Am I going to have an environment where I'm going to be hearing and, and being poured into by, by words of affirmation? Or am I going to be in an environment that is full of pessimism and full of discouragement? Mm. I get to control some of that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you, you go on in this, uh, you talk about, of course, the community, you know, around us mm -hmm. and I, cause you know, this is, this is show is a book show and an author show. And we try to help people in leadership and success and life business and, and, and careers. And you talk in here, you say that the average American reads three books after they graduate from high school. Mm. Yes. And, you, and, and, then you give this exclamation point three and you said that breaks my heart for them. Um, and then you give this quote, not every reader is a leader, but one thing I've seen time and time again, every great leader is a reader. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's, I agree with you because that's why we do the show. I mean, I read a book a week for the show, right? Mm -hmm. Because I read it cover to cover because I know the power of reading yeah. books and and I'm trying to get people out in the world to understand, you know, okay, you, here's a book, right? Do you hear what the author's saying about the book? <laughs> you know, okay, but why don't you get this and then yeah. fulfill yourself with it, right? But I, 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 I am, I, I, I just so agree with um, what you're saying there in terms of uh, read, 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 read. Um, the, one of the things I want to talk about is uh, you say there's a subheading. It's called "I am for you." Mm -hmm. And you talk about authenticity and humility. Mm -hmm. So help us understand authenticity and humility as it connects to being teachable. Yeah, I, I, this this the, the subheading there actually comes from a, from a work by Jeff Henderson, who has talked a lot about leaders helping to communicate a truth to those they lead and those they serve. I'm for you. I'm not against you. This is not about something I want from you. It's about something I want for you. And his book, Know What You're For, is one I highly recommend. Leaders have the opportunity through authenticity, through transparency, to communicate that to those they lead. If all the people that they're leading, if all they think is that you're just trying to draw something from them, right? You're just a cog in the machine, right? You're just, you're just here to help accomplish my goals, my dreams, and I'm just going to take what I need from you. You come and we'll trade your energy and your expertise and your time for dollars. Well, guess what? That's, that's how you've made them feel. What if they knew that you were actually for them as a person, that you saw them as a 3D human being, that you wanted to help them to succeed and to thrive with the dreams and the goals that are in their heart? Here's what I've discovered. When I treat my team members as actual 3D human beings, when I pour into them and invest in them and help them to understand that I'm for them, not for what they do, but for who they are, when I help them to understand that, that doesn't mean that, that they bail at the first sign, the first chance somebody offers them a buck more an hour or whatever. You know what? They lean toward me. They're going to lean into what we're doing together because they feel valued. They feel like someone is in their corner. Someone is for them. Leaders have the opportunity to do that. We serve those we lead first and foremost. Yeah. And 
you know, it, you got me thinking here, William, that, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of quiet quitting right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I, 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 it got me thinking in a different direction that, you know, we're blaming these people for quitting, but maybe we're not doing a very good job of valuing. I think that's spot on, Jay. I think that the problem is that too many leaders have adopted the the old model of leadership where you sit in your corner office and you send out dictates. Do this. Do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. How do people feel? Well, they feel like they're being dictated to. They're being directed. They don't feel valued. They don't feel a part of the team. They feel like a cog in the machine. Yeah. If you help them to feel like they're a part of what's going on, that they are valued, not for what they do, but for who they are, guess what they're going to do? They're going to lean in and they're not going to bail the first chance they get. I've just seen it too many times in my own journey and with so many of the clients that I've coached. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you, you really got me thinking here. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe this answer that, Maybe this we've got this answer all wrong. We're blaming generations, right? We're blaming men, millennials or Gen Z or whatever. But maybe we need to take a closer look at ourselves and say, what have I done to value them as a person? Because who wants to leave if you're if they're being valued? Yeah, it starts with leadership, Jay. And I yeah. think you're I think you're spot on. The easiest, easiest thing in the world to do is point a finger. Yeah. Easiest thing to do. Point yeah. a finger. It was their fault. They're lazy. Yeah. They're, uh, you know, easiest yeah. thing in the world to do. Yeah. But, yeah. That's. But, but you're asking, you're asking the wrong, you're not even asking a question. Right. You know, right. If you start to ask the right questions, you're going to get the right answers. Right. We, yeah. Well, we're, we're attributing, we're attributing the wrong why. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. We're attributing the wrong why to it. That's, that's beautiful. Um. Okay. Let's, let's look at number two. I guess it's number two, right? Discover your wiring. Yeah. Right. So okay, what, what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Discover your wiring. What are you saying? Here? I can hear them. I can hear the, I can hear them saying that. You know, you and I are different. Okay. We are wired differently. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Shocking, right? Shock. If, if we were to look at our internal wiring, how we are designed, we're not going to be identical. And yet so often when it comes to emerging leaders, they try to force themselves into a mold of a leader that they admire, a leader that they respect. And this is common and this is really pretty normal when you're early in your leadership journey. There's somebody that you, you see from a distance or somebody that you work for and you're like, I, I need to be like that. And you try to fit yourself into that mold. And that makes sense at the beginning because you're trying to figure out who you are. But if all you ever do is try to fit into that mold, it's like trying to wear somebody else's clothes, right? Ultimately, all you're going to end up becoming is a bad copy of a great leader. What I want to do is help you discover how you are designed, how you are wired. And then let's lead from that, from that spot. Yeah. No, I, I have said, I have said this, you know, people say, oh yeah, I want to be like Steve Jobs. I'm like, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. I said, how much is the Mona Lisa worth in the Louvre, right? Just give me the yeah. price, whatever, whatever you think it is, right? And then I go, do you know you can buy a copy of that for $5.30 on Amazon? Yep. Yep. Tell me what that's worth. Well so said. You, right? I mean, I mean, j just put it in that context, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be a copy of that or right. do you want to be, do you want to be an authentic part of who you are? And that's the key word there, Jay, authentic. I want to help leaders be authentically them <laughs> to lead from that center of who they are in an authentic way. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I, and I think this is where, you know, people struggle because I think sometimes we're just not comfortable with who we are. Hmm. Yeah. And I think part of it is we, we are still trying to hold ourselves up against a standard of what we think a leader should look like mm -hmm. or what we think a leader should be. And we think, well, I'm not that, therefore I must be lacking. I must be failing. No, you're, you're misunderstanding. That's not the only thing a leader can look like. Right. Let's take an example. Let's use, use me as an example here. On the Myers-Briggs, I'm an ISTJ. 
Okay, the I stands for introvert. If you were to look at me on the chart, there's a there's a spectrum, right? From from all the way extrovert and all the way introvert. Well, so I'm over here. Okay, so I'm off the screen, like all the way introvert. You can't get any farther that direction than where I'm at. Right. That means just, you're gonna. Need, that means you're gonna need some time alone after this conversation. Uh, just, just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> but I build that into my life. <laughs> So, you know, for the longest time, I looked at great leaders and thought, well, they're all extroverts. They're all because you look at them, you look at their highlight reel, right? And you think, oh, I'm, I'm building a picture of who they are from what I can see. You know what I've discovered? That's not true. They don't all fit one mold. Some of the greatest leaders you and I have ever heard of are strong introverts. Yep. The key is, do you manage it? Do you lead from who you are or are you trying to be something you're not? Right. Good. And it goes back to authenticity. It begins with discovering your wire. And that's why that's the first thing I do with a new coaching client. We discover how they are wired. That's the very first thing we do. Right? Same thing here. Same from thing here. there, then we will move into their goals, their priorities, where they want to go from here. We'll move into all that. But first we have to identify who they are. Then we identify where they are. And then we identify where they want to go. Right. Because who they are, how they are wired is going to affect everything else. Absolutely. His name, so beautifully said, we are so on the same page and, and yet we're very different. Uh, his name is <laughs> Dr. William C. Hadaway, the book, Catalytic Leadership, 12 Keys to Becoming Intentional Leader. If it makes a difference. You're listening to him here on A New Direction. Hey, folks, listen, Epic Physical Therapy. You know what? Here's the deal about Epic. You know what? They have the latest most cutting edge type of line equipment like the Alder G anti-gravity treadmill, Norma Tech compression sleeves, my favorite, the game ready. It, you know what? That's just a few. Listen, they're trained, certified, most comprehensive cutting edge treatments available like blood flow restriction therapy, dry needling, cupping, and that's just a few. When you're ready for your epic relief, your epic recovery, your epic results, don't look any further. Go to epicpt.com. That's E-P-I-C-P-T.com. And listen, Linda Craft Team Realtors, I'm just telling you, Folks, that wherever you live in the world, they can help you in an unbiased way. Here's why I say that. They do not belong to a national company. She has made relationships with the top real estate professionals in your area, period. If you want an unbiased you know, approach to saying, I'm looking for some a great realtor in my area, start with Linda and her team. They will find the best professional, regardless of the company, that will help you sell your home or buy your next home. If So if you're ready to make that start and you want to make that transition, go with Linda Craft Team Realtors. That's lindacraft.com, L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. And we are back here on A New Direction with my friend, William Attaway. Uh, hopefully, he, you're enjoying this a little. I hope, I'm hopeful. Absolutely. I'm loving it. Good. I, I'm too. I'm, I'm enjoying this. Uh, by the way, we're, we'll talk about our Clifton Strengths Finder because I know you're an input guy. So, um, uh, we'll and and hopefully that's happening for you a little bit here. Um, <laughs> let's look at number three: actively pursue intentional growth. What are we saying here? You know, again, I go back to this idea that nobody wakes up one day and says, "Hey, I'm a mature leader." How did that happen? If, if you want to grow as a leader, understanding leadership is a skill that can and should be developed, then that's going to mean you have to be intentional. And the only way you're going to stay intentional is if you actively pursue that. That, again, is a choice. And if I sound like a broken record by saying the word choice so often, hmm, maybe that's a theme we should pay attention to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you mm -hmm. and I get to decide if I'm going to actively pursue intentional growth. We decide that. We decide that every single day. Right. Too often, a leader will get into a leadership role. And at the beginning, they have no choice because they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to learn. They're on a they're on a learning curve that's pretty steep. And they've got to they gotta stay into that posture. But over time, they begin to feel like, you know, I, I got this. I, I'm, 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 I got this now. Mm -hmm. And they begin to throttle back. And that's the danger zone. Right. right. That's the danger zone, because then you're going to start to drift a little bit. And you know what, Jay? You never, ever drift into excellence. You only drift into mediocrity. Ooh. And excellence inspires people. <laughs> mediocrity doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. 
if you're intentionally going into mediocrity, you have a problem. You have to be intentional. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Uh, okay, let's bounce to number four. Uh, be boldly action oriented. Mm-hmm. Talk about that. Yeah, you know, I, I think I think it's important to understand that that leaders want the ball, like we were talking about earlier. You know, like catalytic leaders are ones who want to make a difference. If somebody's going to toss you the ball in a game, you're like, no, no, I don't, I don't want it. I don't want it. Send it somewhere else. Let me help you out. You're probably leadership is probably not your gift, right? right. And right. that's okay. You may you have other gifts. We'll help you find those. Right. But leaders want the ball because right. they want to make a difference, right? right? So if, if, if understanding that, then that means you are going to be bold in that. You are going to be action-oriented, right? You're going to have a bias toward action, not toward passivity. Mm. Great leaders want to move the ball up the field. Mm. Okay, I, I know you're from Alabama, so you have a lot of championships at your home state. So. Um, I get it. So I understand the analogy going on there. Uh, <laughs> we can talk about Bear Bryant if you'd like. No, that, that's okay. I mean, we can. That, that, that's okay. We, we, can, <laughs> we, can, we can leave that right there where it is. I, I'm going to say this, though. You know, if you want the ball, right? Because yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I want the ball. Yeah. And when it's crunch time, I want the ball. Yeah. Yeah. But that also implies that you're willing to take the risk. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're not willing to take the risk, then you don't want the ball. <laughs> Because taking the ball is, in fact, a risk. Right. Because you could fail. Right. right. You could get the ball and you could you could get tackled. You could be on the ground. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's I think this I think this is the thing, right? I think everybody says they want the ball until they understand. Okay, do you understand the risk involved here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm pers- I'm a person who goes, you know what? Crunch time, give it to me. Yeah. You're not right or wrong, I'm going. Yeah. Right. I think that's and I think that's a huge I think it's a huge point because I think everybody says, yeah, I want the ball in crunch time. Okay, well, all right, you really, you say that, yeah. but when it comes to your business, are you willing to risk it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Are Are you okay failing? Mm. Mm. Nobody likes to fail. Right. Nobody looks forward to that and says, yeah, but are you okay understanding that failure sometimes is part of being action-oriented? Mm. Sometimes that means you're going to fail. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about emotional driven decision making, because that's part of this, too. It is. It is. You know, I think emotions are a, a part of who every one of us is. And and too many leaders will will try to, to subjugate that and try to, like, push those down and pretend they don't exist. And <laughs> I only make I only make decisions that no emotion at all. Okay, <laughs> they're part of who you are. OK, you right. just got to accept that. You got to understand it. But here's the key. And this is what I will often tell clients. Emotions are a necessary passenger in the car of your life. But never let them drive. Mm. If you let emotions drive, you will end up in the ditch 100% of the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's why we start the program. I talk about the emotional part Mm -hmm. and that they are a part of who we are. Mm -hmm. And they're an important part of who we are. They are. But you can control them. I think this is where I think this is where people miss it. Is they they feel like, well, you made me feel this way, William. Hmm. You, you made me no, no. Right? I mean, you control this, how you feel. Yes. And that's yes. and it's and it's and and by the way, you talk about that. You know, emotions do drive behavior. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, do you want your emotions driving your behavior, or do you want your beliefs driving your behavior? There, so your thoughts. You what are your decide. core values, right? It comes down to what are your core values, right? That's right. You decide. If you want your emotions driving your behavior, get ready for the ditch. Because you're, you're going to end up there. Mm. Mm. That's good. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Are you okay with that if I skip ahead? Yeah. No, please. Okay. How about uh, how about evaluate ruthlessly? I, I, first of all, first of all, I've never heard evaluate and ruthlessly put together before. So, <laughs> but I really loved it. Uh, evaluate ruthlessly. Go ahead, give us what that is. There is this. There's this idea that experience is what makes you better. The more experience you have, the better you are at something. I think that is a terrible myth. Uh, experience does not make you any better. 
does it? Uh, you could have one year of experience that you have repeated 30 times. That does not mean you have 30 years experience. That means you have one year experience that you've repeated 30 times. Okay. Experience does not make you better. You can have experience doing something wrong for 30 years. Again, doesn't make you better. Right. Experience doesn't make you better. Evaluated experience makes you better. Right. And so this is why evaluation has to be critical on the part of every leader. This is part of the team that I lead, the leaders that I coach. We talk about this all the time. There's an evaluation process that we use every time something happens, every decision, every event, everything we're doing. We're going to ask three questions. My team can recite these three questions in their sleep. I have no doubt about that. And they've heard them so often. And I've heard them use them with other people now, which I love. What went right is where we start. We're going to celebrate the wins. Right. So often as leaders, all we see are the problems. All we see is what went wrong. All we, all we see is the next obstacle, the next hill, the next mountain. I, I get that. I'm the same way. That's our default wiring. But you know what that means? That means we're wiring our brain. We're rewarding our brain for recognizing what's wrong. Mm, right. <laughs> I want to start in a different place. I want to start celebrating the wins right. because I want my brain to understand that's the reward. That's where we begin. Our team starts there. What went right? We're going to celebrate every win we see. Then we're going to move to what went wrong because you have to move there. You have to understand what went wrong. And then the last question, how do you make it better? How are we going to make it better next time? What's it going to look like the next time we encounter this? Now, this is something we use with our team, but this is part of my weekly review, Jay, that I use personally. Right. When I'm doing my weekly review every week, I think back over the previous week, the meetings that I've had, the decisions that I've made, the, the context that I had been in. And I think through what went right. And I capture my wins because I want to celebrate those again, training my mind. What went wrong and how will I make it better next time? What that does is it wires that into my mindset. So that the next time I'm in a similar situation or a similar circumstance, I will have processed this already and I can benefit from that learning. If I don't take the time to review it and evaluate it, I will not carry that learning forward and I won't get any better next time. You know, it's so interesting that you bring say that because I've interviewed a blue angel on this, mm. on this mm. show. Yeah. And he talked about that their AARs or after action reports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Start with the same three questions. Yeah. They, they, that what went right, what went wrong, and then what are we going to do better next time? Yeah. And he he made a point that you know after every show they do that every single show. Yeah. They they go through those three questions and in that order. And I just thought it was so interesting because that you brought that up. And I'm I'm I'm, I'm I don't know that you ever talked to a blue angel before. I've but. never spoken to a blue angel. <laughs> <laughs> at the least that I'm aware of, but I, maybe, maybe you have, uh, but no. I, I just was like, you know, I was like, so interesting that you're applying this back mm -hmm. to, to the business. Um, we, we've got just a couple minutes left here. So by the way, this has been great. It's been outstanding. Oh, um, I've too. really enjoyed having you on. Can you, can you leave us with something and tell people how to get a hold of it, hold of you? Sure. You know, I think if, if people only hear one thing today, I hope they hear this. The decision to have a teachable spirit is one that you make. You can make it every day yourself. You choose that. And if, if there's only one thing you walk away from this with, I hope you walk away with that. It costs you nothing. But if you will simply apply that principle, choosing to intentionally have a teachable spirit every single day, no matter the circumstance, no matter the conversation or the relationship, if you will apply that, you will see a difference in your life going forward. And that's beautiful. Tell people how they can get a hold of you. Sure. You can find out more about what I do at catalyticleadership.net. And I would love to put a copy of this book in the hands of every one of your podcast listeners. We're actually making it available for free. My goal is to put this into the hands of as many leaders as I can so they can benefit from what I've learned from so many other people. If they go to catalyticleadershipbook.com, uh, they're willing to pay the shipping so I can get the book to them. We will put a copy of that book 
in their hands for free. That's for continental U.S. listeners. If you're outside the U.S., you can get a digital copy for free. Same website, catalyticleadershipbook.com. I will have that. I will have that link on the blog post that's associated with the show, so that people can do that. So that will be there. Uh, hey, folks, stay with me, William. Hey, folks, you know what? That's the show. You know what I say to you every week, right? You're in control of three things: your attitude, your effort, and getting back up again. Your resiliency. The truth of the matter is, I know your circumstances can be rough right now. I know they can be tough. I know they may be difficult and hard, but you're in control of your attitude, your effort, and getting back up. Take control. Do it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be back next week with another great guest. It's going to be another great book. It's going to be another great show. As I say to you all over the world, everywhere, thank you so much, and ciao, everybody.